excited to talk to Joe because I've been following him for several years. I don't remember the first thing I ever saw from him, but I believe you were playing a shovel. Yeah, I'm one of the one of the um, most well-known shovel players in the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, uh, have you entered any talent shows uh, for shovel playing? <laughs> no, they, it's usually lack of talent contests for shovels. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Joe is kind of famous for building his own instruments out of uh, unique objects, things that you would not expect. And these instruments are not exactly, I mean, it's not just like a guitar with a different kind of body. It's uh, new kinds of instruments and you explore just different uh, options, opportunities, ideas. So, you know, talk us through a little bit about your creative process and the musical instruments that you've made. I'm I'm someone who has been uh, been interested in musical instruments for their own sake for for a long time. You know, kind of the the musical instrument this thing about them. So, I don't know exactly where the differentiation comes, but I know a lot of people who are who play guitar who just love guitars, you know, or whatever. But I was really interested in. In, in how many different kinds of, of instruments they are. And, and for example, the way that the saxophones, you know, the soprano is, is straight and the alto gets slightly curved and then the tenor more so, but then the baritone is ridiculously curvy and the bass baritone even more so. There, there's something about that, just the, uh, the nature of instruments that has been, um, I don't know, kind of gnawing at me all this time. Um, so I wanted to find a, some kind of musical practice to have where having a lot of instruments and having them strange, I don't know, was kind of part of it. So that's the, that's the, in a nutshell, that's what I want is to explore musical instruments. I guess the strange thing to me is listening to this album, I would have no idea that you're playing, you know, a tennis racket. There's no indication that the instruments on the album are unusual in any way. And the music you're making is not particularly unusual either. So I kind of wonder, like, is this really like you have to be there in person to see what this guy is doing? Is that how it works for you? The exciting thing about the live show is having all the stuff that you see behind me. But when people come in, they see all this stuff it kind of encircles me when I'm on stage. And I, I usually get the vibe from people that they're saying, there's no way he's going to, he's not going to pull it off. Not with all that junk. And then when I play music that sounds, you know, it, this is music that sounds like music. It's not the... Uh, it's not like John Cage, or it's not like, I, I mean, pick your your outsider artist, but it, it's not music that is uh, anything other than 12-tone Western music. And, and it's the juxtaposition of those two things that's so fun, is that it looks like weird junk, but it plays stuff that's that's immediately recognizable music. So that's what's at the heart of the live show. Because of that, I, I resisted making an album for so long for exactly what you said. If you heard it without knowing, you probably wouldn't know that it's all tennis rackets and shovels and cane. But um, people kept insisting, you know, I was saying it, it wouldn't be exciting enough for the listener to just hear regular music, not knowing what it was. And too many people said to me, that's crazy. You've got all these tools. Uh, they do all these unique things. See what kind of 45 minutes you could make out of that. Uh, whether or not people get the, get the exact feeling position just do a creative work with these tools and see what they you know what they offer so that's the spirit in which the album is made it's just what are these things what do they want to do did you um 
Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here, but it, it sounds like it's primarily uh, loop-driven music. And yeah. that makes sense because if you're going to do a live performance with an array of strange instruments as a one-man show, you're going to have to do some looping, right? <laughs> so were these, uh, is this a set of compositions that have evolved over time through your live performance shows? Or is this just something that, you know, you said, I want to sit down and do something specifically musical in this vein? Because as I mentioned to you before we started, um, some of the tracks remind me a lot of like Michael Manring's uh, album, The Book of Flame. Well, keep it, keep it coming. <laughs> well, I heard a lot of Zappa in there too, for sure. Uh, I, it's hard not to, you know, it's hard to avoid certain textural elements. Like when you hear a clarinet on the lead or whatever you're playing, could be PVC pipe for all I know. Um, it's hard to avoid like Paul McCandless, you know, hearing him on the book of flame or hearing uh like on hot rats you know the the frank zappa album with a bunch of saxophones and clarinets and there was that era where frank was really into those woodwind instruments as leads and harmony uh instruments so you know it's hard to know am i influenced by the sound of the the combination of instruments you know guitar bass and uh clarinet or is it the music? So like, talk about, did, are these artists that mean anything to you? Were they inspiring to you, you know? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, to talk to you for so long is because I know your audience takes those things as a given. Whereas with other audiences, I've got to spend a lot of time explaining who Paul McCandless is before we get to the point. So I know your audience knows who you are and, and all those people were really, um, uh, part of my heavy listening when I was like, I don't know, basically a teenager. So so Book of Flame, definitely. I, I loved Michael Manring, especially Book of Flame, because that album um, was more musical than the other one. You know, I think it stood more as a piece that you could put on start to finish. So I used to put that on my on my Discman and go like walk around in the woods. You know, that was it was great to just like kind of disappear into that way. And at the same time, um, Bela Fleck and the Flecktones double album Live Art had Paul McCandless on it extensively, also bass clarinets. So hearing him in both of those contexts really made an impression on me, especially his his bass clarinet playing to extend his oboe and English horn too is like, once again, here's a here's someone doing something really kind of against the grain as far as his instrument goes. And so that that led me to check out Oregon and his work there. Um, and Zappa, definitely, especially Hot Rats. Um, that one really made a mark on me. I, I, part of the problem with Zappa is that there's there's so much of it that uh, you got to kind of like pick your pick your touchstones. So uh, Hot Rats was was one of them. Um, there's an album called Just Another Band from L.A. that the whole A side is is this uh, kind of audio teleplay. Billy was a mountain. That was one we used to listen to uh, all the time. And I don't know some other stuff. Too, but Hot Rats definitely I probably left the biggest impact on me as far as like oh here's something here's something to aspire to this like horn driven you know kind of rock music so yeah all those things really into it. Awesome. Um, do these instruments like uh, have you had other maybe guitarists or bassists, woodwind players, you know, pick up these instruments and they're like, oh, yeah, this is just like 
totally familiar or you know what is it like i i don't think you can have an objective perspective here because my guess is this is a majority of what you've been playing for the last several years but like this is your norm <laughs> what do people say when they step out of their norm and into your world and try your instruments out most of them are not tuned outrageously so usually people can get comfortable on them pretty quick so i i played a gig in december where while I was setting up, a guy who was a bass player asked me um, the suitcase bass. And he the scale length is a little a little longer than than almost any electric bass. After a little adjustment for the distances, he knew just what to do, and it's tuned the same way. It's tuned in fourths like an electric bass. So uh, there's there's almost none that are really tuned. Like there's there's none that are tuned say only in I don't know like minor ninth or anything they're all they're all tuned something that's that if i tell someone i say oh it's you know it's tuned like a guitar but uh you know fourth lower I, I can explain pretty quickly what's unique about it but nothing is tuning wise nothing is insane so did you start with the the music or did you start with an instrument you know like how, how does this thing how does this world sort of what's the seed that gets planted that creates this garden of uh, strange things behind you. And could you maybe share a couple of your favorite things, your favorite yeah, instruments? I, I think one of the, one of the first ones is this one that's got a stop for a body and a hockey stick for a neck. And I kind of wanted to make an instrument using only found parts. So the, the tail here is, is called a grounding board. It's something you can get at the hardware store where like you ground all your fuses to. And the, the strings or the frets are zip ties. So I don't know if you can tell, but those are all zip ties making the frets. And so basically it's it's almost entirely out of found parts. And I did a couple a couple like this before I started to to let my a little bit free of the constraints that they only be made from found parts. So I started using real frets for the frets, started using real um, I don't know, nuts and, and tail pieces and stuff like that. And, and got more interested in like, uh, so not just, first ones are kind of proof of concept. Could you make the stuff just out of junk? And then freeing myself a little bit, I started to think, well, could they be more like art pieces? So even if you had to use, um, if you had to like, what's the word? These were useful things that I destroyed. So, so this is a salad bowl right here. I bought a salad bowl because it had to be just this size to fit, you know, the way I wanted to in the piece. But I started to think as, as art objects, could I make things that um, were sculpturally interesting and did some musical thing interesting and whatever combination, you know, whatever those things did in conjunction, then take that as a starting point for the, for the music. Is uh, that uh, Mike Wazowski from Monsters Inc. on the backside? I don't know if it is. It's not a. Uh, it's not intentional. <laughs> okay. Well, that's really cool. It's funny you showed the grounding bar. I installed my own uh, electric breaker box. You know, yeah. I put in my own ground wires here in the studio. It's all in the corner over there, and it's the same concept. I mean, as a as a tailpiece, you're you're instead of putting strings in, you're putting braided or solid copper wire, and then um, for the frets, it's. I mean, the old lutes and even modern lutes are the frets are you can move them. They're just like zip ties, except they're actually tied, you know, so I imagine it. You're just reimagining or repurposing everyday things to make stuff that's functional. I mean, I'm not with you. Are these good instruments to play? Do you enjoy <laughs> playing them? <laughs> The the great thing the great thing about them is that there's there's not one that does everything well. So if if you buy a guitar at the store, you've got to expect that it will play chords and play melody, play in the low register and the high, and and these are not like that. These are all instruments that have have like one or two things that they do really well, and one or two things that you can't do hard at all, and and that itself is inspiring. So so. This one here uh, makes it hard to play. You know, you get stopped here, uh, but there's there's notes to get here, but you have to like reach out to get them. That's kind of a challenge when you're playing is to think like, 
okay, I want a note up there. What can I do that buys me a second to like get my hand out? So, like a loop that has something there that buys me a second that I could get up and over. And there's a lot of ones like that. They've got some little technical challenge that uh, that makes it fun to try and overcome. Say you say, what is this instrument's strong suit? And then can I build something that's got that starts with its strength? And they all have little strengths and weaknesses. And that's kind of the uh, joy of being on stage as you go, all right, this one does that thing well, this one does that thing well. Does that two do those two things make a song that only get you a quarter of the way? And if it if it happens, it happens in real time. I'll do those things and I'll go, this is not this is not a song. This is still just like this is still kind of an intention. Something else has got to carry the what's that gonna be? So it's all built on constraints. It is. Um, but now that I have enough I have enough of them now that there is there is like an hour of music. Okay, that was called Bump in the Night. And I want to say this in a way that doesn't sound insulting. <laughs> it's not a backhanded compliment. I can't believe how good these instruments sound. Like, this is a great sounding recording. Uh, and that fretless bass sound, you know, it's it's got a really nice acoustic tone. And then that the thing doing, it sounds like you're plucking. Doon, 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 doon. Yeah. it's got like a it sounds like vibes but it sounds like plucked vibes it's like a really unique sound so it makes me wonder like how many instruments have you made that are just brand new sounds you know <laughs> so the the things on that track the, the first thing is a kind of a a little kalimba that normally this thing sit on a on a pair of legs so that it's it's a uh, free to it's just kind of freestanding so i can play it while i've got something else on so that's the first thing. I, I don't know if you can hear this, but. So this is just a little electric kalimba and. Oh, it's an electric one. OK, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it's got some transducers on the underside so you can give it some juice. And the, the bass you're hearing is my old standby. <laughs> the suitcase bass. Suitcase bass. And it's fretless, so that's where some of the, the tones on that, that tune come from, is doing a little bit of a, let the fretless do the thing that it does best. What is the neck on that thing? Uh, the neck is a ski from an exercise device called the Nordic Track that my parents had. And, uh, and I took this without asking. <laughs> Nordic track. I remember those commercials yeah. when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, they, they had one and I don't think they ever used it because I think uh, it wasn't as good an exercise device as the commercial made it seem. So this is this is one of the phase of trying to trying to use only found parts to make them. Nowadays, I'm probably not using Nordic track ski. Um, and the, the suitcase, I just love because it's got like the tags on it and stuff. It's got a, a Copenhagen like that's, and, that's uh, awesome like awesome Japan and bali and stuff too so this this one is uh uh is one i really feel like it was an object that um i don't know get like a second chance at a kind of like uh i don't know to be a different kind of object this was who knows whose closet this was in all this time and now it's on stage i don't know it's i like that stuff and the the last thing from that uh that bump in the night 
effect. This one, I, I know I keep grabbing this because it, it's, uh, it was close to me, but this is the one that makes that sitar sound. <laughs> And and that's due to the the fact that I that I made a kind of a sitar shaped bridge for it. So that's not electronics that's making that sound. That's the acoustic sound of it is is uh, is sitari because it has a sitar style bridge, or at least as as close to one as I can make. It sounds like it's fretless, but it has a banjo neck on it. Yeah, a banjo neck. Right. So this is taken off of a, a banjo, and I I kind of built the rest of it to suit it. So it's fretted like a banjo, um, but I'm able to, I play it in kind of a way to try and get some of the, the tones out of it that I want. Well, and how is it, why does it sound fretless? It has frets. It, it has frets uh, because I, I do those kind of slides over the top of it. Um, I don't want to make too much of this, but I, but I'm studying South Indian music for the last few years with the teacher Vidushi Saraswati Ranganathan. So some of the techniques we use in our lesson for getting some of those tonal things, those those slides like that, I tried to put some of that to use um, in a respectful way on that tune, Bump in the Night. So maybe some of that is, um, my lessons are actually starting to pay off. Well, I think it's fantastic, man. And uh, Thank you. I, I wish you, you know, the most success possible with this stuff. Uh, tell us where and when to find your album, you know, like, and obviously you do in-person shows. Uh, that's a majority of your act for lack of a better word, but, uh, tell us about like where you are, how people can see you and, uh, when this album comes out and how they can get it. Where I am is in the suburbs of Chicago. So most of my playing happens in and around Chicago and the neighboring States. I actually, I live in Indiana, but I live very close to Chicago and in the part of Indiana, that's the Chicago suburbs. So most of my playing is around Chicago, sometimes though in Indiana or Wisconsin. And, um, but I'm excited to do more playing. And so if there's, if there's anyone listening to this who thinks that they have a, an interesting opportunity elsewhere, um, please get in touch. Cause I'm, I'm really open to all sorts of different kinds of things. The album I expect will come out sometime around like late spring or early summer of 2023. I've done my recording and now it's being mixed by uh, Jack Zofel in Los Angeles. And so when he tells me it's mixed, then it'll be mastered and released. Um, but he's kind of got his hands full because uh, he's got to mix tennis rackets and shovels and uh, bags of rice and cat food cans and stuff. And so I, I think that's taking a... Um, it probably takes a lot to get all that stuff he's sounding right. So I'm, I'm trying not to hound him about, about getting it done because he's really got his work. This is awesome. And uh, I'm really excited to hear this album. Thanks for letting us preview uh, some of it. I don't know if that was your intention when you sent it over, but hopefully that's okay. And we'll, uh, we'll get people into it. Thank you. And so now that I've been a guest on the show, do I get added to the group chat with Manring and Steve I? And... <laughs> yeah. Cool. Just, yeah. Whenever you're ready, just add me in. And, yeah, um... no problem. Look for the invite. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.